By what name are you known? There are some who call me... Tim. Welcome to another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And today it is Tuesday and that means we're going to dive into the Wizards Cup, this tournament where Wizards are challenged to make a deck with the sets Fallen Empires, The Dark and Homelands. And we have reached the top 16. Remember, we started with 37 players. Only 16 remain. The creme de la creme. And in this first top 16 match, we're going to look at Elmar, who's playing a mono black deck that he's called Airstrike. And he's going to take on a Dwarven Brew by Rob, a player from the Netherlands. So it's mono black versus mono red. Now, if you want to know more about this tournament, the ins and outs, the restricted list, deck pictures, all that stuff, Check the description below and there you will find a link to the tournament website. It is really worth a visit. It's pretty cool. And maybe you'll be inspired to organize your own Wizards Cup. If you do, by the way, let me know. I would love to hear from you. Um, for now, we are going to continue to the deck deck, of course, because I've got beautiful deck pictures of both of these decks. But before I do that, I would first like to mention that you can also skip this section. And how can you do that? You can check the description below and there are several timestamps. One of the timestamps reads MTG Games. You can click on there and you can go straight to the games. Or you can stay here and here we are going to look at the deck photos and we're going to discuss both of the decks. I'm going to start with the deck of Elmar, Mono Black Airstrike. And this is the deck of Elmar. So he's called it Mono Black Airstrike. And um, actually I'm already surprised when I'm looking at the deck because yes, there is some flying, but I also see a lot of creatures that actually don't fly. Uh, one of the creatures I notice uh, first is Uncle Istvan. I think it's so cool. It's a 1-3, three, 3 black and 1 to cast. And it reads, all damage done to Uncle Istvan uh, by creatures is reduced to zero. And then under Uncle Istvan, he's got two Feasts of the Unicorn. Now, if I'm not mistaken, uh, Feast of the Unicorn is an enchant creature that gives plus 4, plus 0. Oh. So this is a really cool idea, right? He's going to cast Uncle Istvan. Then he's going to cast a Feast on top. And you've got a 5-3, kind of like a juggernaut, but the big difference is it cannot be killed by uh, creatures. So that is actually really cool. And looking at Feast of the Unicorn, I think it's really um, useful on a lot of creatures, actually, that Elmar has in his deck. Because the Order of the Avon Hand Pump Knights, you can give those first strikes. So they would actually be turning into 6-1 creatures, and you can give it first strike for one uh, black. You can also consider, because there are some flying creatures in this deck, putting your Feast of the Unicorn on, uh, unicorn on a flyer, like Bog Imp, and also we've got Sangir Bats. Now, Sangir Bats is something, uh, you know, it's three, two black and one to cast for Summon Bats from Homelands, Flyer, and whenever a creature is put into the graveyard at the same turn Sangir Bats damaged it, you can put a plus one, plus one counter on the bats. But remember, it's only a one-two, so that means that basically... It's a 1-1 one, one killer and then it can grow. And what I find kind of annoying is that uh, the creature type is a bat. So it's not um, a vampire. And I understand because it's not a vampire. It's a bat, right? But what kind of annoys me here is that we also see Baron Singir in this deck. And one of the things that Baron Singir can do is you can tap and it can regenerate target vampire. And I think it's kind of odd that Baron Singir cannot save his own Singir bats. So for me, that's kind of a flavor fill. I, I feel like Baron Singer should be able to save his bats. So I was hoping maybe they change the errata to make it into a vampire bat or something that at least you can regenerate it with Baron Singer. Unfortunately, that is not the case. Um, a cool thing, by the way, to do uh, with the Singer bats is play Thrall Retainer on the Singer bats. Uh, Thrall Retainer is an enchant creature from um, Fallen Empires. And it gives target creature plus one, plus one. So then the Sengir Bats become a 2-3. And also, you can sacrifice the Retainer to regenerate the creature that it enchants. So imagine you've got a Sengir uh, Bats with Thrall Retainer on it and Feast of the Unicorn. Then you've got a 6-3 creature that actually grows when it kills other creatures. And it can regenerate because of Thrall Retainer. That's actually pretty cool. Um, okay, what else do we notice when we're looking at this uh, deck? I think it's going to be very consistent, obviously, because it's all mono black. I think Ashes to Ashes, one of the stronger cards in the format, so that could do some serious damage. It's two black and one, and uh, it removes two target non-artifact creatures from the game, but it does five damage to you. And when we look at this deck, I don't see any life gain um, in the deck 
of Elmar. So that's a little bit risky to play Ashes to Ashes without life gain. I'm saying a little bit risky. It's not very risky, but you can have situations in the game where you're too far behind in your life total so that you cannot use the Ashes to Ashes anymore. And therefore, you often see people playing it with some kind of life gain. We saw it uh, being played with Dark Heart of the Woods in the Dark Tournament a lot. And I guess in this case, he could have added a, a Fountain of Youth. Not that that's like the answer to all your problems, but um, it's worth taking into consideration when you're thinking about Ashes to Ashes. Um, perhaps you're looking at this deck and thinking, why is he only playing with one Him to Turek? Of course, Him to Turek, one of the strongest cards in Fallen Empires. And this is, I think, the most popular version with the Crying Wolf from Suzanne uh, Van Camp that we see here in the deck of Elmar. Uh, this card is restricted, so it makes sense that he only plays with one. Then I also see a few really cool cards. I see the Ragman, which uh, is a card that actually I've seen before in this tournament. It's quite popular. It's it's really a card that I like. Uh, two black and two to cast for a 2-1 creature, so that's not great stats, but it does something funny. Uh, three black and tap, and then you can look at the target opponent's hand, and if there are creatures in that hand, he has to discard one of those creatures at random, right? So that's um, that's always kind of funny. I think, by the way, that that is his sideboard, so it's not his main board, right? Wreckman, Thrall, Wizard, Turex, Chan, all those cards are on the left. Uh, at the top, you can see the dry spell stack. So all those cards on the left are his sideboard. I didn't realize that now uh, at first, but now that I'm looking at it, I do. Uh, maybe one last card to discuss, and then I, I feel like we can move on to the deck of, of Rob, the, the Red Dwarfs. Um, one card that's very powerful is Broken Visage. It's a very powerful removal, I believe. I haven't seen it in action yet, so I'm hoping to see it in action in this match. Broken Visage, one black and four to cast for an instant, and it reads Buried Target, non-artifact attacking uh, creature, and put a Shadow Token into play. So that's kind of interesting, right? So it, it buries a creature, then it put a Shadow Token into play. Treat this token as a black creature with power and toughness equal to the power and toughness of that attacking creature. Now you do have to bury the shadow token at the end of the turn, but that means that um, in theory you can use the uh, broken visage to basically kill two creatures, right? You bury his strongest creature, you get a token, you can use that token uh, as a blocker to uh, kill another creature. So it is a two for one. It is pretty expensive for five, but I do think it's uh, it's powerful. We do also see um, some strong black cards, by the way. We see Baron Sengir, of course, but also Ice and Shade, which is for six mana, a 5-5 five, five that has got protection from white. Not It's not going to be that relevant, protection from white, because he's playing against Mono Red, but I, I can imagine Ice and Shade must have helped him uh, in the group stages a lot. Uh, but okay, this is the deck of Elmar, um, Mono Black, Airstrike, and now we're going to look at the deck of his opponent, Rob the Red Dwarves. Let's go. And here we see the deck by Rob, and it's actually called Dwarves Summoned by Aaron, and Aaron is Aaron the Relentless, so maybe it's interesting to start with that card first. A card from Homelands, a legend from Homelands, two red and three to cast for a 5-2 creature with haste, so it can attack straight away, and for three red you can regenerate it. Now, uh, it's interesting that it's summoning dwarves because according to the lore, Eren is actually the Goblin King uh, of this uh, expansion. So that's quite interesting. So maybe that's a little a little joke from Rob. And if we look at the deck, actually, uh, look at the deck picture, I should say, we do see Dwarven Runes and Dwarven Holds, and the dwarves are kind of coming out of their runes and holds. So that's, that's pretty, pretty cool. And it's really not just a Dwarven deck because it's got one or two dwarves, no. Dwarves really are a big deal here. We've got, we see Dwarven, uh, Dwarven Hold and Dwarven Catapult, which is always a combination I really like. Uh, we see Dwarven Lieutenants, we see Dwarven Soldiers. So it's pretty cool. We also see Dwarven Pony, by the way, and I think I think it's quite nice. So Dwarven Pony, um, you can tap Dwarven Pony, and now I've got to check. Uh, oh yeah, you've got to pay one and one red and tap, and then target Dwarf gains Mountain Walk until end of turn. So uh, yeah, that is that is really funny. So it's really nice to see Dwarven Pony in the, in the deck. We also see Dwarven Trader in the deck. Uh, another really cool card we see here is Heart Wolf. Heart Wolf is one red and three to cast for a Summon Wolf. It's got First Strike, it's a 2-2. Two, two. And you can tap it and then target Dwarf gains First Strike and gets plus two plus O oh until end of turn. So that's pretty strong, right? And it's pretty unique, I think, that uh, a card pumps a creature and gives First Strike. You'd, I don't think you see that in old school. I think Heart Wolf is the only card that can do that. Um, the thing is, when uh, if the dwarf that you targeted, if that dwarf leaves play, 
then you've got a buried hard wolf as well. So it is, it is kind of risky, right? It could cost you two creatures. So it's a risky move, but I like it, you know. Um, looking at the rest of the deck, I think there are three orcs in here. You know, orc, of course, the 6-6 six, six trampler from Fallen Empires that cannot attack or block if your opponent controls a creature, an untapped creature, with power greater, greater than two. And I think that untapped part is, is quite relevant. You know, it usually proves to be quite relevant. And then, of course, because it's red, we see a lot of ways to deal damage. We see two Infernos. We see uh, two Eternal Flames. We see how many Dwarven Catapults? Four Dwarven Catapults. Dwarven Catapult, it's huge. It's one red and X, it's an instant. And it's kind of like a fireball, but different. Because what Dwarven Catapult does is it automatically divides the damage you deal um, to the creatures of your opponent. So you cannot deal it directly to your opponent, so you cannot target uh, the opponent. It automatically targets all the creatures of the opponent. So how does that work? For example, if your opponent has uh, two creatures on the board and you play a Dwarf Catapult for six, it deals three damage to both of those creatures. Now, the reason why I'm putting the emphasis on the fact that it's an instant is because that means that you can use it in the turn of your opponent and it also means that you can use it during combat. So if you would combine that, for example, with first strike abilities or with, um, I don't know, a Brothers of Fire that can deal with extra points of damage, it is quite useful. So in combat, you could kind of use that as a strategy uh, to finish some creatures off with the Dwarven Catapult. I think Dwarven Catapult is really one of the more powerful cards uh, in red and definitely in, in Fallen Empire's red. I think it's the most powerful one. Um, then we also see uh, a card, let's see, it's called Retribution. Two red and two. It's really good removal from Homelands. It's a sorcery and it reads, choose two target creatures controlled by an opponent. Bury one of those creatures and put a minus one, minus one counter on the other. That opponent chooses which creature is buried. So, of course, the opponent chooses... But worst case scenario, you weaken one creature, you bury the, uh, the other, so destroy the other. And in the best case scenario, you kill two birds with one stone, right? So with one retrib retribution, you destroy two creatures of your opponent. I think that's actually quite useful. I know it's sorcery speed, I understand it's four to cast, but I think in this format, that is pretty good. Now what I'm noticing actually here is, I don't think I see a fissure. And this really surprises me. Maybe I'm missing it in this deck photo, uh, but I'm not seeing a Fisher. Most mono red players play with Fisher. Fisher is two red and three to cast destroy target land or creature, an instant from the dark. He's not playing with it. Instead, he's you know he's made different choices, going for retribution, for example. And another really interesting card, and a card that I always have to read twice, is Orcish Mine, by the way, and that's a way to destroy lands. It's uh, a two red and one to cast for an enchant land. And when Orcish Mine comes into play, put three uh, counters on it. I think three, are they called mine counters? Anyway, three counters. During your upkeep and whenever target land becomes tapped, remove one of those counters from Orcish Mine. When the last counter is removed from Orcish Mine, uh, destroy the land Orcish Mine enchants. Orcish Mine deals two damage to the land's controller. Right? So Orcish Mine is kind of a way to slowly kill the land of your opponent. It's, so funny, like it's like the same casting cost as a stone rain, but but much worse. But anyway, um, it slowly kills the land of your opponent. But the upside is it does deal two damage as well. And I think that's quite interesting. What I find hard when I'm playing against these decks is when I'm kind of in a standstill situation, and I've, I've, I've had this before, uh, I know that my opponent has that Eternal Flame. And Eternal Flame is just an, an incredibly strong card. So Eternal Flame is... Two red and two to cast for a sorcery from the dark. And Eternal Flame does an amount of damage to your opponent equal to the number of mountains that you control. But it also does half of that amount of damage to you rounded up. So let's say you've got nine mountains. That means that with this card, Eternal Flame, you can deal nine damage for four mana. That's like insane, insane value. And yes, it does mean you get five damage uh, back to you as well, to your life total. But I mean, I think Eternal Flame... It, it could be like really a game-changing card. It can be a winner. It, it's such a good finisher. And, and like I said, what you have often with these games, they tend to take a little bit longer. And um, that's actually not a problem for uh, Rob. You know, it's actually good. It's like, okay, the game's going to take longer. It means I get to play up more mountains and my Eternal Flame gets more powerful and more powerful. And, you know, I can now just Eternal Flame my opponent for 10 or something. 
and, and, and win the match with an Eternal Flame. So I'm really going to keep an eye on that. I, I really think Eternal Flame is going to have a big influence on this match. But maybe I'm wrong. I mean, I've, I've been wrong plenty of times. Anyway, this is the deck of Rob. We've looked at the deck of Elmar. Let's go to the games. Game number one, here we go. Let's see, I believe we've got Elmar sitting on the left and on the right we've got Rob with his Dwarven deck. Uh, okay, there are some issues here. Uh, <laughs> I just love these techniques. What are you doing, Elmar? <laughs> Guess you're trying, uh, you're trying to get the zoom back and you're actually successful playing a basic swamp. Does he have a one drop? I'm not kind of going through his deck list. I don't believe he's got a lot of one drops in his deck. There's an AO pile from Rob and uh, another swamp. And okay, there we see Order of Light Burr. So the 2 1 Pump Knight from Fallen Empires. And okay, this is a great answer actually. Brothers of Fire. So Brothers of Fire, card from the Dark, a 2 2. And for 2 red and 1, you, t you can deal 1 damage to any target and you also take 1 damage yourself. So that means that next turn, possibly, uh, he can use the Brothers of Fire to kill the Order of Light Burr. And there is a swing, of course, makes sense. Probably not going to trade here. I guess he's just going to take two damage and playing the Sengir Bat, which is a 1 2 flyer. And yeah, it looks like he's taking the damage. I'm going to 18, drawing a card for turn. And he's going to kill the Order of Lightbird here, taking another damage. Going down to 17, he's going to swing in here. Remember, the bat is only 1-2, so probably going to deal some damage. Elmar is going to drop here to, I believe, 18. And untapping for turn. So no land drop here for, uh, for Rob. So that's good news for Elmar. Maybe he can, uh, he can take the lead now. Although that uh, Brothers of Fire is a pain. He's got a lot of one toughness, two toughness creatures in his deck. Oh, a Thrall Retainer. That makes it a 2-3 creature. And he's going to swing in now, dealing two more damage. So that life total is slowly going down. He's now on 15. And there is a mountain. So he's found his land. Attacking with Brothers of Fire. So he's going to drop here to 16. Of course, he could consider using uh, Ao Pile and the Brothers of Fire. Oh, what's that? That is an orcish mine. And that's an enchant land. And you see those three counters that are now on the land of Elmar. So every upkeep, one of those counters ticks away. And when all the counters are gone, the land is destroyed. And Elmar will get two damage as well. And what I wanted to say is that Rob can use Brothers of Fire and Aeopile to kill the bats. But um, because of that Thrall Retainer, he can sacrifice a Thrall Retainer to regenerate the bats. So that's probably not a very good option. And ooh, what card is this? This is the Eater of the Dead, I believe, a 3-4 creature from the dark. And when it's at, when it's tapped, you can remove a creature from your library to untap it, so to basically give it vigilance. And that's actually a pretty strong creature for toughness. That's going to be hard for uh, for Rob to kill. Aaron the Relentless swinging in here. That is pretty sweet. 5-2 with haste. He can trade it for the Eater of the Dead. I don't think that's a bad trade, actually, because you can um, regenerate Aaron for 3 red. But, of course, the 3 red are now tapped. There's the block. There's the trade. And I think that makes sense. I think for both players, it's actually uh, a good trade. And it looks like those bats are going to swing in again. The life total of Rob is now uh, 13. There's another attack. So Rob going down to 11. And this is actually quite an exciting game. You also see those counters on that swamp slowly ticking down. Remember, when the counters are gone, the land is destroyed. There is, I believe, a Bog Imp, a 1-1 Flyer, and another Order of, uh, of the Ebon Hand. And the Brothers of Fire, it, it it can deal some damage here. It can kill the Order of the Ebon Hand or the Bog Imp. Remember, it does mean that Rob will have to take a damage. Ooh, playing a Retribution. That means that Elmar now has to sacrifice one creature and put a minus one, minus one counter on another. 
And this is why Retribution is such a strong card. Card from Homelands, two red and two to cast for a sorcery. And you know, this is a problem here for Elmar because he's actually going to give up both of his creatures once to keep the bats around because that's the thing that's basically killing Rob here. He's going down to 12 himself. The Brothers of Fire have dealt a lot of damage, done a lot of work this turn. And I think he's going to swing in with the bats again. Going to put Rob here on 9, probably. That's exactly what's happening here. It's going to go down to 9. Remember that AO Pile can also be used as direct damage. Attacking here with Brothers of Fire. Going down to 10. Tapping 4 red. What are we going to see here? Ooh, the Heart Wolf. Oh, that's so cool. So Heart Wolf, you can tap it to give target Dwarf plus 2, plus 0 oh, in first strike. And I believe the Heart Wolf itself is a 2-2. Two -two. We talked about it briefly in the deck deck. It's a card you don't see often. And I think it's really, really cool that Rob's playing it. It's very, very flavorful. Very much in theme of playing with the Dwarves. The risk, of course, is when you use the Heart Wolf to pump a Dwarf. If the Dwarf dies, the Heart Wolf also dies. Oh, Ashes to Ashes. But this is risky. Remember... Uh, Rob is playing with two Eternal Flames main board. If he can find an Eternal Flame, he's actually dead. Ooh, using the AO pile directly on the life total. And this is a bad sign here for Elmar. Is he going to die? Well, this, yeah, Eternal Flame, he's dead. Oh, man, that is tough. We spoke about it briefly in the deck deck that, you know, playing um, Ashes to Ashes without life gain is risky. And here you see exactly why that is oh man what an exciting first game so both these players are going to go through their sideboards and we'll catch back up with them in game number two and we're going to find out who's going to win this top 16 matchup game number two and here we go so elmar needs to win this to stay in the tournament there is a mulligan from rob here putting a card on the bottom so at least that's something for elmar the winner will continue to the top eight so both of these players managed to uh to get into that top 16 with a 37 uh, total field of players. There is that order of the ebon hand again, Dwarven Catapult. And what you see really here in this matchup is that all those one toughness creatures are just too vulnerable to the removal of, uh, of Rob and he's got a lot of removal in deck. Usually order uh, of the ebon hand, one of the stronger cards in black, especially Fallen Empires, but it's just not strong enough it seems against uh against a deck of rob okay and this is really a cool card here dwarven pony and a dwarven catapult so dwarven pony is a one one and for one and one red you can give target dwarf mountain walk so again a really flavorful card here and there is the bog imp and we also saw another dwarven catapult by the way on the order of the ebon hand <laughs> and wow he's just removing everything now the ao pile on the bog imp it's still one for one trade, so it's actually not too bad for Elmar. I kind of feel he really gets in trouble as soon as, for example, uh, Rob will be able to use a Dwarven Catapult on like three one toughness creatures or something. That's what you want to prevent. As long as it's just a one one trade and we're kind of in a standstill here. It looks like Elmar cannot find any more black mana sources. So he just has to pass turn. There we see Dwarven Soldiers, a two one creature, and it gets a bonus when it blocks an orc. But I don't think that's going to happen. And there is, is finally another Swamp for Elmar. Can he do something with it? Maybe it's uh, Sangir Bats. I believe they are three to cast. One, two, Flyer. Tapping three here. And yes, there is a Sangir Bats. It's actually not too bad because the creatures of Rob don't have flying. So at least he can ping in for some damage. On the other hand, maybe you want to keep it at bay to uh, possibly block the creatures of Rob. Though he's got that Maze of If, of course, as well. It's really nice to see a Dwarven deck with Dwarven Pony and Dwarven Ruins, by the way. It's, it's very cool, and the Dwarven Soldier on board. Attacking here with the Bats. Rob going down to 19. Another pair of Bats. For example, if he now has another Dwarven Catapult, he can get both of those uh, Bats out of there. Does he have that? And, oh, Retribution. Ah, uh, so he's got a second creature and put a minus one, minus one counter on the other creature, basically making it an O1, making it use, useless. And we also see the Dwarven Hold, by the way, 
uh, played by Rob and Dwarven Hold. Quite an interesting card, and I guess Elmer's going to take a damage here from the Dwarven Pony. So Dwarven Hold is one of those storage lands, so it comes into play tap during your upkeep. You can put a storage counter on it, and when you untap it at a certain point, you can then tap it and take an X amount of storage counters off. So what you can do with the Dwarven Hold is keep it tapped for a very long time, and then, for example, play a huge Dwarven Catapult. And here we see an Ashes to Ashes taking care of two creatures on the side of Rob, but it also means that Elmar's got to take five damage, dropping to 13. And I mean, he's looking for a creature. He's looking for a way to put pressure on the table. And he's not finding any more lands, by the way. And that's very unfortunate because I think what you want to do when you're Elmar right now is you want to play your, your Baron Singer. You want to play your Ice and Shade. You know, you want to play a big fat creature. Maybe you want to play an Uncle Istvan uh, with a Feast of the Unicorn on it to really start doing some business. But remember, Rob removed so much at the start of the game, so many creatures, and it looks like both players are now just top decking, trying to find something. There's Swamp number four, tapping four here. Okay, there's uh, Barrel Skage. Not that relevant in this scenario. It's, it's, it is actually a good, a good artifact. You can pay three and then target a uh, creature doesn't untap during the next untap step. And you can do that multiple times. So it's a poly artifact. There we see Elmar's just passing turn again. I mean, when you're playing against red and you're on, on 13, you don't just want to do that. There's an eternal flame. So that means eight damage. You're going to go down to five. Also damage for Rob, but look at that life total. This is not good news. And I, I think when you're Elmar, you kind of know this, like, oh man, this is not going well. I kind of feel like in this second game, Elmar's a little bit, he needs a little bit more luck here. This is his last chance. If he loses this, he's actually out of the tournament. I'm not sure what Rob's doing, kind of looking around his house. I have no idea, <laughs> but he's back at least. Beautiful Dwarven Lieutenant on the board, but of course, uh, that's not a problem here for Elmar with the Maze of If, with the AO Pile. He's got so many ways to take care of creatures right now playing the Order of the Ebon Hand, the third one in this second game. Can it stick around? Oh, it's done. It's done. An Inferno. Oh, man. This is just, this is the thing with red, and this is kind of what I talked about during the deck deck, right? Because this is exactly what happened to me as well. So, I mean, Elmar, I can so relate to your situation. You're actually playing pretty good you're having control of the game but you're just not drawing into enough firepower to put enough pressure on red because if you give red too much time which kind of sounds weird doesn't it because usually mono red is super aggressive and and mono red wants to have a quick game but in these in this me uh, meta it's actually pretty good for mono red to go into the late game because then he can play inferno he can play eternal flame he can just deal tons of damage without really having to do much else you know and then win the game on that we saw that in game one we're seeing this in game two so this means that these, this dwarven army is going to continue into the top eight and, and who knows where it will end i must say this deck is looking flavorful and it's looking very strong i also enjoyed the deck uh, mono black airstrike by elmar i want to thank you both for joining the tournament and for sharing your match right here on timmy talks and i want to thank you for watching another episode of Timmy Talks, the channel where we talk old school magic. And you remember, if you want to follow this tournament, just uh, tune in again next week, Tuesday, because then we'll have a new match. If you want to help the channel out, by the way, you can like this video, leave a comment, share it on your socials, and become a subscriber if you're not subscribed yet. Um, there's something else you can do. You can also sponsor the show financially, and you can do that by becoming a patron on Patreon. There's probably a card popping up right now. Click on that card, and that will take you to the Timmy Talks Patreon page. And there you can check out all the perks when you're uh, when you're joining the fantastic Patreon page of yours truly. And uh, talking about that, one of the perks is that your name will be in the end scroll. Who doesn't want that? Talking about that, let's go to the end scroll and let's take a look at the fantastic, the amazing, the wunderbar patrons and channel members of Timmy Talks.